you know, McCarthy and Schaefer almost lost everything to the fires that ravaged Central Florida. This year, conditions are eerily similar to that fateful year. And last weekend, Carson had a fire a thousand feet from his home that required several trucks and a helicopter to extinguish. Mm -hmm. That night, as he was feeding his horses, the smell brought it all back. Please welcome DTM Carson Schaefer with his speech, The Fire. Thank you very much. A 100-foot wall of flame coming straight at your house will really focus your attention marvelously. Fellow Toastmasters and guests, on July 2nd, 1998, Central Florida hadn't seen rain in months. Fires raged everywhere. 25 miles of I-95 was closed because of smoke and flames. All of North Brevard County had been completely evacuated. <coughs> Firefighters have been flown in from all over the country to combat the blaze. And then a fire started to the west of us. Now, my nurse wife quickly grew concerned, but not me. I know nothing bad is ever going to happen to me. Yeah, boy, was I wrong. Just about the time my wife said, to heck with you, and started frantically packing, a sheriff's car screams into the yard, Guy says, it's moving at 300 feet per minute. Get out. It's about this big by now. And I thought, oh, maybe I should devote a modicum of attention to this problem. <laughs> Our home used to be surrounded by deep, dark woods that came within 10 feet of the house. The key words in that sentence are, used to be. There was a cash for timber crew that was working down the road. And we went over and grabbed them, because the fire's about this big by now. And they really frantically got to work. And in an hour, they cleared about 100 feet all the way around our house. In fact, one of my neighbors goes, dang, man, if they was working regular, they would have taken three days at $150 an hour. The fire grew closer. So we let all the animals out, and we had left with one load of valuables, and my buddy I played a band with, Ron, shows up. And Ron walks in the front door of the house, sees a big box of pictures, goes, he's going to want this. Turns around, and there's a cop standing there saying, why did you run my blockade, sir? Ron looks down, and the top picture is Ron and I. Two o'clock in the morning, down in the Keys, with arms around each other. Each one of us has a bottle of whiskey. Just got out of the water. I got my black, cool black and red dive skin on. Ron's standing there in my wife's pink and purple neon spandex bodysuit. Cop looks at it, starts cracking up, and goes, go ahead, get out of here. So our house was the command post for the fire. We had 12 fire trucks there, everything. So I Figured, yeah, they're not going to let the command post burn, <laughs> right? <laughs> what a sight that fire was. It's a hundred foot wall of flames as far away as the buildings over there and a good deal taller than the buildings. If you are ever threatened by a fire, get out. Don't mess around. Just leave now. We left when the firefighters said that everybody that didn't have turnout gear and oxygen had to go. So that was the end of me. Went to the post office a mile away and watched. The entire sky at 11.30 at night was bright orange. You could read a book easily standing outside. And the brightest, most intense spot was right where my house was. So at 2 a.m., the battalion commander comes on TV and said that my house burned to the ground. And he said it was the last house on Sisler Avenue. It was where the command post had been, and he was just talking to the owner, so we knew. And it was weird, that because of that, we went to sleep. Because we could sleep, we knew what happened. So the next morning, we drove out. And everything for miles was absolutely burned to the ground. 
We learned that three firefighters disobeyed direct orders and stayed keeping water on our house, getting it wetter and wetter until they were completely surrounded by fire and flaming trees were falling across the driveway and they left. They pulled back to phase line B, which was 100 yards behind the house and abandoned the house to the flames. The flames came within 10 feet. We had vinyl siding, all the siding melted on the house. The thermometer on the front porch locked up at 158 degrees. The curtains charred and crushed when you grabbed them. They got it so hot that it didn't burn. They got it so wet that it didn't burn, rather. I bought them a half gallon of Glenfiddich single malt scotch. <laughs> It wasn't really enough to say thank you, but as a military guy, that's how I was taught to say thank you to men of valor like that. Continued to flare up and burn for 10 days. And I had my kids, who were three and five, dragging a 600-foot hose around the yard, putting out fires day and night for 10 days. I wanted them to know that they didn't have to be afraid of fire, that they could put it out, and that they had control over their destiny, and it worked. They never had any nightmares. Although my son's a wildland firefighter, engine captain, burn manager for our area, so it probably had some effect. Fire last weekend with the helicopters, all the fire trucks, really brought it back. All in all, the barn burned, the outbuildings burned, all the fencing burned, and the well burned. It was so weird to be able to see miles through what had been impenetrable woods. After two decades, most of the signs of the fire are gone, but some are still there. During the cleanup, we even found we owned a few things that we didn't know we had. Or as Jeff Foxworthy might say, if you have a fire and find you own three more cars and two more motorcycles, you might be a redneck. <laughs> Mr. Toastmaster. <laughs> oh, that was great. Thanks.